Good morning. Welcome to Bridgeport United Methodist Church. If you're visiting with us today, we extend a welcome. Thank you for being our guest and joining us in worship. We are a Matthew 25 church, a community of faith focused on being in ministry with the least, the last, the lonely, and the left out. In Matthew 25, 40, Jesus said, when you do it to the least of these, you do it unto me. We have gathered this day to worship, pray, and hear from God's word. We will thank you to the world to serve in Jesus' name. Let us stand together as you're able and share together in our call to worship you'll find printed on the front of your bulletin. The Lord is our rock, our fortress, and our deliverer. Our God, our rock, we take refuge, our world, the horn of our salvation, our stronghold. We love you, O Lord, our strength. The Lord lives, blessed be our rock, and exalted be the God of our salvation. We will call upon the Lord who is worthy. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you with grateful hearts. As we gather this day, we ask for your presence to fill this place. Open our hearts and minds to receive your word and let your spirit move among us. Strengthen our faith and deepen our understanding of your will. May our worship be pleasing to you and may we leave here transformed by your love and grace. Grant us, O oh God, courage, wisdom, and humility. Help us to act with grace even in challenging situations and teach us to be peers, seeking your guidance in every decision. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. And now let us pray together with the confidence of the beloved children of God, just as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join together in singing our hymn of celebration number 110 in the United Methodist hymnal, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
seated. We have many opportunities for you to be involved in worship, study, fellowship, and service here at Bridgeport United Methodist Church. Please visit our website regularly at bridgeportumc.org to check for updates on worship, learning, and ministry opportunities. In your bulletin, you will find information on several exciting opportunities coming up in these summer months. Our Summer Wow! Wonders of Worship series, Sunny Days of Faith, meets every Sunday at 9.30 during the Sunday school hour. We invite all children ages 3 years old through 5th grade to join us on this fun and faith-filled journey throughout the summer. They meet downstairs in the primary chapel. Vacation Bible School is open for registration. It will take place July 21st through 23rd from 6 to 8 p.m. Three-year-olds through eighth graders are invited. Youth, parents, all, and all adults are invited to help. You can register online at bridgeportumc.org. All youth are invited to a pool party next Sunday, July 7th from 3 to 6 p.m. at the Randolph's house. If you need a ride or additional details, please contact the church office and ask for Joe Starkey, our youth director, and he will help you out. Shepherd's Corner, our local non-denominational ministry to assist those in need in Harrison County, is looking for a few good men. If you could volunteer a few hours a month, please call Karen Lang at 304-842-2873. Also see the announcements about the United Women in Faith's Brummage Sale and the United Methodist Men's Benedim Open Golf Tournament coming up in August. Finally, if you have a prayer request on behalf of yourself or someone else, please complete the blue prayer request card that you'll find in your pew during the final hymn. Our prayer stewards will collect those prayer concerns and bring them to the altar to lift up those needs. Our pastors and staff will continue to pray, pray for those concerns throughout the week. We also, um, I have a note here that no one has signed up for the mission meal for July 21st. So if somebody could help sign up for the Clarksburg mission meal for July 21st, I know that would be greatly appreciated. There are also still dates in September, October, November, and December available. We thank you for your generous support of the mission and ministry of Bridgeport United Methodist Church. Your gifts make a difference, and we want to remind you that you can give in a variety of ways. You can place your gift in the offering baskets on the way in and out of the sanctuary. You can mail your gift to the church office using the address on the front of the bulletin, or you can visit the website at bridgeportumc.org and use the e-giving tab. There is also a QR code in the bulletin that you could use to take you directly to that location. Now, as we offer our gifts to the Lord, our financial gifts, but also the gifts of our presence, prayers, time, talents, and service, I invite you to please stand as you're able and join us in declaring God's praise as we sing our doxology number 95, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. Please remain standing as you're able for our scripture from 1 Samuel chapter 25. There was a man in Moan whose property was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal and the name of his wife Abigail. The woman was clever and beautiful, but the man was surly and mean. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel to, and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. Thus you shall salute him. Peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have shearers now. Your shepherds have been with us, and we did them no harm. And they missed nothing all the time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your sight. Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son David. When David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal. But Nabal answered David's servants, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants today who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and the meat that I have butchered from my shearers and give it to the men who come from I do not know where? 
So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. David said to his men, Every man strap on his sword, and every one of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword, and about 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained with the baggage. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Reese Allen today shares the word and music, a prayer litany based on the prayers of Saint, by St. Saint Francis of Assisi and St. Richard of Ch- Chichester. prayers, those are some of the most powerful prayers that we have within our Christian tradition, and we're thankful that we can have those prayers to guide us in those times when we need words to pray, and uh, we're thankful for for that, and thank you, Reese, for sharing that this morning. Let us go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare to receive the word and uh, continue our series in the life of David, uh, broken and beloved. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your presence here among us. We thank you that you, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, will speak to us as we explore your word together. Lord, we pray that you would change our lives, that you would mold us and make us into the people, into the disciples that you are calling us to be. May our hearts and ears be open to receive from your hand. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, David was doing everything right. 
He had killed that Philistine giant Goliath, ending the impasse with Israel's enemy. Through his music, he played the harp, and he brought healing to King Saul's tortured soul. But the relationship between David and King Saul quickly deteriorated. Something within Saul snapped, and he suddenly hated David and repeatedly attempted to kill him. The first murder attempt took place while David was making music on his harp, just playing for him. That music that had once been a source of healing became a cause of hatred. So Saul hurled his spear at David, muttering, I will pin you to the wall. Out of the corner of his eye, David saw it coming and ducked. That spear landed just inches from David's head. Saul tried again and David ducked again. The irrational outburst escalated into carefully calculated assassination plots. Saul had promised to marry his daughter Merab to David on the condition that David prove himself in battle. Saul's plan was to expose David to such continuous danger that the Philistines would surely kill him. But when David showed up after the Philistine battle, alive and ready for the wedding, Saul hastily married Merab off to another man. He had no intention of conferring son-in-law status on David. Then Saul learned that his other daughter, Michael, was in love with David. And he used that information to plot yet another murder attempt. And he promised David that he could marry Michael if he would present him with 100 Philistine foreskins. That's right, 100 foreskins. You know, surely out of 100 chances, one of those Philistines would kill David when he was trying to, uh, to you know, obtain what he needed to get. But David, uh, showing no signs of being offended by this outrageous demand, went off and killed double his assigned quota. That's right, he presented the king with an obscene dowry of 200 Philistine foreskins. And this time the marriage took place. Michael, the daughter of Saul, became David's wife. But Michael's love for David only aggravated Saul's hatred of him. So the king's next attempt on David's life was going to be conducted by a death squad. Saul ordered his hired killers to stake out David's house and to kill him first thing in the morning. But Michael discovered the plot. And she helped David escape that night through a window. She then put a dummy in his bed with a head of goat hair. When the assassins came to get him, Michael answered the door. She opens up and she says, my husband's sick and he can't come out to see you. And the killers, they must have been operating under some ancient code of honor because they felt constrained not to murder a defenseless sick man. Instead of barging in and making short work of David, they went back and they reported to King Saul and they said, King David was ill in bed and he couldn't come out to get murdered. <laughs> in rage, Saul ordered them to bring David to him, bed and all. He would kill David himself. But when the men arrived, all they found in bed was the dummy with the goat hair wig. All of the resources, the massive resources of the kingdom are extended against David. But after each outbreak of violence against David, King Saul becomes weaker and more distraught, but David becomes stronger and more beloved. As we come to our text for today, David is on the run. He is running for his life in the wilderness as he attempts to escape the murderous King Saul. In the chapter right before this, 1 uh, Samuel 24, while pursuing David in the wilderness, Saul stops at a cave to use the restroom. And while he's there using the facilities, he didn't realize that he had put his life in the hands of David and his men because David and his men are hiding at the back of the cave. But David refuses to take advantage of a vulnerable King Saul. He refuses to raise a hand against the king and forbids his men to harm him. But uh, when he's not being closely pursued by Saul, David found good works to do in the wilderness. Because the wilderness is a dangerous place. You have all the natural dangers of the, the elements and the natural dangers of the animals. But the area of the wilderness was also a high crime district. 
Robbers would frequent the wilderness and prey on travelers as they passed through. Remember one of Jesus' famous stories is the story that takes place as a traveler is going through the Judean wilderness. And that traveler gets robbed and beaten and then rescued by a Samaritan. Well, that's the kind of rescue work that David and his men appear to have been, do been doing in the wilderness. They were a band of good Samaritans. And it's David's good Samaritan work that leads to his encounter with Nabal. Nabal was a wealthy landowner. And when we're introduced to Nabal, we are told that he was surly and mean, but that his wife Abigail, on the other hand, was beautiful and intelligent. In other words, it was beauty and the beast. The herdsmen who cared for Nabal's flocks were especially vulnerable to wilderness outlaws, and David had provided protection for them. Later on in the story, one of Nabal's herdsmen will testify that David and his men were like a wall of protection for us. They protected us and the sheep day and night. And in protecting people from danger, I kind of think of David's company as forming a kind of unofficial neighborhood watch group. As these ruthless outlaws from the area, David introduced a semblance of law, and Nabal's herdsmen were benefiting from that. Here in chapter 25, it is sheep sharing time. Oh, what an exciting time it is! It is a time of celebration, it is a, a festival. As the year's harvest of wool was gathered, banqueting tables would be loaded down with food and drink. The long, hard hours of sheep cheering would give way to a grand celebration, a big party. And David just happened to be in the neighborhood during sheep cheering time, and he sent ten of his men to ask Nabal for some food and drink from the feast. It was a reasonable request. After all, David and his men had been out there protecting Nabal's shepherds in the, in the wilderness all year. And no doubt, David and his men were living on minimal, uh, minimal food because there's not a whole lot to eat out there in the wilderness. Some of Nabal's fresh fruit and baked pastries would have been a welcome change. But when Nabal hears David's request, he acted as if he had never even heard of David. And he lumped David in with all the common criminals who were infesting the wilderness in that day. He said, oh, there are many servants nowadays who are breaking away from their masters. This David's just another one of those renegades. We're not going to help this guy out. So Nabal not only refused David and his men food from his feast, but he also insulted David. And David was outraged. Soon as he hears this, he determines to exact a bloody revenge. He calls on his men to arm themselves, to strap on their swords. And so they set out for Nabal's feast where they would kill Nabal for his ingratitude and his rudeness. This insult hath provoked David who says, May God deal with me severely if even one man of Nabal's household is still alive tomorrow morning. From that moment on, Nabal was marked for death. But David had lost his temper. David had lost all sense of his identity as God's anointed. David had lost touch with God's call on his life. David, who had been able to see maniacal King Saul as a temple of the Holy Spirit, David, who had been able to have mercy on King Saul, couldn't see Nabal as anything but an ugly piece of garbage that was a stench in his life. David was on the verge of becoming another Saul. David was on the verge of being one that was just trying to get rid of anyone, threatening his status and his role. But the Bible says that Abigail, Nabal's wife, heard what had been said. Abigail got wind of the insult and she anticipated the consequences. She took swift action to head off David's predictably angry response. She gathered the makings of a magnificent feast. She loaded everything on donkeys, and she set out to intercept David. And the moment that she sees David and his men, she dismounts. She goes to her knees. She puts her face to the ground in reverence and respect. And she says, David, please don't do this. 
David, this isn't an action worthy of a prince of Israel. Remember who you are. Remember God's anointing. Remember God's mercy. Don't stoop to fight grudge battles because, David, your task is to fight the battles of the Lord. And then she makes this statement. She says, David, I shall be bound in the bundle of the living under the care of the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies... He shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. In other words, Abigail says that God is like a shepherd with a pouch. And that David's life is in the care of the Lord. That David's life is in God's treasure pouch. But that the lives of David's enemies will disappear like stones shot from a sling. You see, Abigail knows that God's hands are on David's life. She's witnessed God's work in David, God's call, God's promise, God's covenant. She knows that David's life is so tangled up in God's work and revelation that there's no way that David can act as if God were not with him. That there's no way that David can act as if God is not working for God's purpose in David's life. David's life is formed and conditioned by the tender mercies of God, not the foolish shenanigans of Nabal. Yes, Abigail witnesses David's, uh, David's, uh, God's work in David's life. We'll get that right. She witnesses how God has protected him and guided him and ruled him and intervened in his life time and time again. And she also knows that when she says that his enemies will be slung out as from the hollow of a sling, that that would be sure to touch David's memory. And it would bring to mind that day in the Valley of Elah where he brought down Goliath, the giant with a single stone from his sling. Abigail, in effect, says, your task, David, your task is not to exact vengeance, because vengeance is God's business, and you aren't God. Nabal is a fool, but don't you also become a fool, because one fool is enough for this story. By the way, Nabal's name in Hebrew is the Hebrew word for fool. <laughs> hey, fool. I, his parents must have really loved him. We should have thought about that name for Isaiah, right? But Abigail carefully reminds David that God had great things in store for him. And that he can't let Nabal mess that up. He would be wiser to move toward becoming king without this bloody vengeance on his conscience or his record. So she says, don't get so caught up in the moment that you mess up your future. Now, Nabal is no Goliath, but the way that David chooses to respond to this fool will be just as significant in the continuing development of God's people, because this could have totally messed up what God was doing in David's life. So, so we asked, how will David respond? And remarkably, improbably, David stops, looks, and listens to Abigail. Abigail, out in the middle of nowhere, out here in the wilderness, speaks God back into David's life, and David lets her speak it. The momentum of the story is stopped and then reversed by Abigail. Abigail, who is marginal. Marginal because she's a woman in a man-dominated world. Marginal because she's weaponless in a sword-rattling world. But marginal Abigail speaks, and David listens. And Abigail surprises David out of his sudden plunge into ugliness, and he sees and he hears God again. Abigail puts David in touch with the Lord again. He realizes who he is, what he's doing, what his life is for. Through Abigail's words, David is changed. He turns from the vengeance-obsessed, honor-defending, out-for-blood David to the David who understands the identity that God has given him. Oh, in our lives, we encounter many Nabals, don't we? You know a few people like that? There are fools aplenty in this world, and they will provoke us from time to time. But no sooner do we set out to set them right than that we engage in the same foolishness that we are determined to get rid of. But Abigail, she tells David, David, don't waste your time and your energy in opposing a fool. 
We need only spend enough time on this matter to discern that Nabal, this strutting, arrogant guy, is a fool, and then get on with what God is doing, which is what David did. Don't let anyone keep you from being who God has called you to be. Don't let anyone distract you from walking in God's plan and purpose in your life. You see, David had been living in God's love, God's redemption, God's plan, but it nearly got away from him as he pursued puny, small-minded revenge. But Abigail put David back on track. Nabal died soon after this, and guess what? David wasted no time. He sent for Abigail, courted her, and married her. So thank God for polygamy again, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, in the Christian life, there's nothing more common than starting out right and then going wrong. We start out with enthusiasm and promise. And then somewhere along the line, we have a ball in our lives. No one's exempt. Someone will offend us. Someone will cross us. Someone will not give us what we want. And our self-importance will flare up. And we'll go off to do something about it. Usually we'll go off to do something about it armed with righteous indignation. Wrapped up in ourselves, we're angry because our self-defined identity is violated. And we're off to hurt, avenge feelings. We're off to, uh, to, to get revenge for our bruised self-image. We want to get even. We want to get back at them. We want to show them a thing or two. Oh, we all feel like we've been done wrong by someone. We will be hurt by another person. We will be mistreated. We will be misunderstood. We will feel like someone else has done us dirty. And at those times, we can seek revenge against the people that hurt us. Or we can entrust the situation to the Lord, the one who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. When the Nabals come into our lives and make us angry, we can let them sidetrack us from our true calling. We can get caught up in the cycle of revenge and keep that cycle going. We can become involved in the moment and lose our long-term perspective on the situation. Yes, we can get even. Or we can realize who we really are. We are the beloved of God. As Eugene Peterson puts it, wrapped up in ourselves, we forget entirely about God. But when we see ourselves as wrapped up in the bundle of God, Nabal is reduced to nothing more than a footnote in the text of our lives. Thank be, be to God. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this word today. Lord, we confess that we all from time to time encounter these Nabal characters, those who get under our skin, those who irritate, it, irritate us, and those, Lord, who would distract us from our true call. We confess that we get caught up in the cycle of revenge and we want to get even. But Lord, you remind us that vengeance does not belong to us, that vengeance belongs to you. And it's instead of perpetuating this cycle of revenge, that we are called to bring all of our concerns and all of these situations to you, knowing that you are the God who loves us and that we are wrapped up in the bundle of your love, that you hold us in your hand and your care. We thank you for those Abigails that speak into our lives and remind us of who we are, that remind us of your purpose. May we hear and listen to those voices and hear your word this day. Help us, God, to be people who are filled not with revenge but with love because we follow a Lord, a Lord who, even when we crucified him upon the cross, did not cry out in revenge. But he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Help us to follow the example of our Lord, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Our hymn of response is number 526 in the United States Hymnal. What a friend we have in Jesus as we stand and sing it today. The altars are open. No matter what situations you're facing, won't you come today and be reminded who you are? You are the beloved of God, and he is here to meet you today. Let's sing together.
Let us remain standing as we boldly declare our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and set it at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to the Lord in prayer today, I invite you as an opportunity is given to lift up uh, the joys or concerns that you might have in your heart. Let us go to God. Oh Lord, we rejoice in your love. We thank you that like David, we are held in that treasure pouch of your love and that our lives are bundled up in you. And God, we thank you for all of the many ways that you are at work in our lives. We give you praise for the many things that we can celebrate as we come into this place this day. We give you thanks for your faithfulness in each and every season, in the seasons including the warmth of the summer. We thank you that you are there and always faithful, just as you are in every season of our lives. Lord, we thank you for our nation as we celebrate this week, our Independence Day. We thank you for this land in which we live. We thank you, God, for all of those milestones that have been celebrated for birthdays, for anniversaries, for other occasions in which we can rejoice in family members and friends. We give you thanks, Lord, for all of the many joys that we celebrate. If you have any joys you would like to lift up today, please lift those at this time. Lord, we thank you that at the same time we celebrate that you are near to those who need your healing presence. We pray, Lord, for all of those who need healing, healing in mind and body and soul, healing in relationships and healing in, in situations, God, where uh, there is brokenness. But we thank you that you are the God who brings wholeness. We especially lift up to you those who are sick and ill. We pray for those in the hospital. We pray for those who are facing surgeries and procedures this week, those who are recovering from procedures, that you would strengthen them. We pray for those who deal with chronic illness and for their caregivers. And especially today, we pray for those who are in nursing care facilities and ask that you would be with them and with those who provide care for them this day. If you have the names of individuals who need God's healing presence, would you lift those names at this time? Lord, we also thank you that you are very near to the brokenhearted. For those who are going through uh, seasons of grief at the loss of loved ones, we ask that you, the Good Shepherd, the one who walks through the valley of the shadow of death will bring your comfort and your peace to these individuals this day. And give them, Lord, your love. For those who need God's comfort amidst grief, would you lift up the names of those individuals or families? Lord, we thank you that you are also at work in our nations and the nations of the world and that your plans and your purposes go forward despite whatever happens around us, Lord. And we rejoice in that. We pray, Lord, for our leaders, uh, the leaders of our country, that you would give them the wisdom and the guidance that they need to make decisions for justice and for righteousness. Be with those at every level of government, God, our local, our state leaders. Give them your wisdom and discernment. And Lord, we pray for situations around the world Situations where there is conflict and great violence. We especially pray today for the Ukraine and for the situation in Israel. And Lord, we ask that you uh, would bring peace into the midst of this situation. 
We thank you for those that are helping in relief efforts to bring needed uh, supplies of uh, emergency food and aid and those who are tending and helping those who have been wounded. We thank you that you are even at work through the United Methodist Committee on Relief and UNCOR that they are, are bringing relief. And Lord, we pray for those that are working for peace and ask that you would hasten their efforts, O oh God. And Lord, we thank you for the church for this congregation here at uh, Bridgeport United Methodist Church, for the church around the world, that you, God, would help us to draw nearer to you and closer to one another, that you would unite us and that you would bind our hearts together so that we might be faithful witnesses to your love, that we would not be like the world who gets caught up in the cycles of revenge and violence, but that we would be caught up only in the cycle of your love. Lord, pour out your love into our hearts so that we might truly be empowered by your Holy Spirit to share your love in word and deed with those within our community here in Bridgeport and around the world. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Let us give thanks and praise to the Lord our God. It is good to give God thanks and praise. We give you all thanks and praise, O God, for your boundless love, wisdom, and grace. We thank you for Abigail, who in the time of David turned away wrath and brought peace. Through her example, you guide us to be peacemakers in our own lives. By heeding her words, David refrained from vengeance and reminds us of the importance of humility. Thank you that you are the God of second chances and new beginnings. Above all, we thank you for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through his life, we see your love and sacrifice. Through his death, he bore our sins. And his resurrection, our greatest joy and hope, assures us of victory over sin and death. O oh God, you made us for justice, but we clamor for vengeance. You made us for relationship, but we insist on our own way. You made us for beauty, but we are satisfied with sentiment. But through your Son, new creation has already begun. As Christians, we are called to leave behind in the tomb of Jesus Christ all that belongs to the brokenness and incompleteness of the present world. Help us to see that this is what it means to be Christian, to follow Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit into the new world, your new world, O God, which your Son has thrown open before us. To you, O God, be praise, honor, and glory forever. Amen. Amen. So wonderful to see each of you in the house of the Lord today. And You've witnessed to God's work in your lives by your presence this morning. I pray that you have a wonderful and blessed week ahead, especially as we uh, celebrate this 4th of July week, and we'll look forward to seeing you back next weekend as we come to worship the Lord. Let's stand and let's sing together our closing hymn, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. We heard these words earlier. I think it's a wonderful prayer to help guide us throughout our week. Make me a channel of your peace. Shadow of your peace, where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. And where there's doubt, to faith in you. Make me a channel of your peace where there's despair in life let me bring home where there is darkness only light and where there's sadness ever joy oh master Consoled as to console, oh, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Oh,
have heard the good news, <laughs> the good news that we are wrapped in the love of God, and that because of that, we don't have to let anything or anyone prevent us from living into God's plan and God's purposes for our lives. So let's experience God's love and go forth this day to share that love with the world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.